What's your life goal? And have you achieved it? Yeah, I married you. Aw, gross. You really need to go out there and make sure the whole world hates you. Oh, perfect. My butthole is all over the internet. A fine wine. She keeps me in the basement and pulls me out when she needs me. If I drink Sambuca, he's getting it. I bought a case. You can tell a lot about a person by the way their tits, pussy, or dick looks. You come near my cheeks and it's not going to be a good day for you, homie. (laughs) This is going to be special. Welcome to the Two Onions Podcast with Danny Daniels and Vic. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Two Onions Podcast. I'm Danny Daniels. That's Vic. Yeah. And I have to forewarn you, if I'm off my game today, it's because <laughs> I'm sitting next to my absolute favorite voice in Broadway. Patrick Page is here, and I'm geeking out. So <laughs> if you see me be really awkward, that is why. <laughs> if, you, if you notice her not paying attention to me, you'll know why. <laughs> That's why. Who are you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so fun fact, I'll give you a background story. I Broadway's new for me. I moved here three years ago. I was more of a ballet opera girl. So he got me into it. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Broadway geek. Have been since a little kid. So <laughs> you lived in New York your whole life. Yeah, my whole life. So, yeah. So we go see a couple plays, see a couple shows. Um, a mutual friend of ours was like, you have to see Hades Town. It's totally your speed. You're going to love it. So I'm like, all right, we'll go. We go. I don't look anything up. I don't open a playbill. I have no idea what's happening. I, we sit down, it's got this really cool jazz New Orleans vibe, and I'm like, I'm already gonna love it. Everything starts, everyone comes out, the first few numbers happen, and then you opened your mouth. <laughs> and I wasn't in the room anymore. <laughs> I disappeared. Like, <laughs> I think, I think. Who your, is this man? <laughs> your first line is, I missed you, baby. I missed you, yeah. Yeah, yeah you said, like, I missed you, baby, yeah. in her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh, that's the voice. Yeah. <laughs> and so, obviously, being me, I stalked you on Instagram, <laughs> and I found out you've done all these amazing roles that I'm super sad that I missed, oh, thank you. that I want to get into later, but I'm just really happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me. It's really nice that, you know, I get to have an uh, opportunity to, to talk to your listeners. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, it's going to be interesting, because we do talk about Broadway a lot on here, but yeah, and we've mentioned mm-hmm. Hadestown a bunch of times. Yeah. So. Cool. Thanks for the uh, support. It's, it's funny. We, we, have, we have this running joke. We plug three plays. We plug Dave and Book of Mormon. <laughs> Book of Mormon. <laughs> Dave yeah. and Book of Mormon, who's, who were friends and put us in touch with each other. Alex in um, uh, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. And you. Oh, yeah. yeah. I yeah. haven't seen Beetlejuice yet. Oh, I'm dying to see it. Yeah, really... Alex, is, Alex is great. Is, yeah, and, and, great and every time somebody comes to us, we're like, you've got to go see Hades Town. The voices great. are great. And it's phenomenal. It's a great play. It really is. It's a well uh, done adaption of a classic myth. Yeah. So yeah, and the music and music is I killer. To the album but that makes it sound kind of kind of stodgy, maybe. But it's not. But yeah, it's not. It's not right? stodgy it's not. at all. It's yeah. actually kind of the hippest show on Broadway in a way. Yeah. Um, but it's made out of Greek myth. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of like Broadway's done this thing where they're taking stuff that seems stiff, Hamilton. And they're right. making mm-hmm. it not yeah. stiff. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're talking about a play about a founding father, and they turned it into rap music. Right. Same thing with this. This yeah. is a three thousand year old myth. Right. That's now, like she said, a New Orleans vibe. It's really cool. Yeah. It's really cool. That's cool that that hooked you right when you came oh, in. Oh yeah. I love, you come into the theater and the set is there, and all of a sudden you go, Oh wait a minute, this yeah. is, might be kind of cool. Especially because the playbill, like it's just the carnation, right. so you have no idea. No idea. And so when, yeah, yeah, when we walked in, we saw all the instruments and the way. I don't want to give too much away, but. I was like, oh, this the, is a yes. The, the band is fantastic. <laughs> incredible. They are so good. You know, it's it's not your traditional Broadway band by any stretch. The so. core band has been doing it now off and on for three years. Those seven players, uh, we had them originally at New York Theater Workshop three years ago. And wow. a lot of them came with Anais Mitchell, is the woman who wrote the show. A lot of them came with her. Um, in fact, the man who plays the lead guitar, Michael mm-hmm. Chorney, did all of the musical arrangements oh, wow. for the show and won wow. a Tony for it. Wow. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. It so really they're, is. they're amazing players, yeah. What is it like playing with a band that you can see? Like, uh, can you see the, like, usually oh, the yeah. band's below you yeah. in a show. Yeah. Can you see them as much as you see the people Absolutely. around you? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, there are, there are co-mates on stage, you know, and it makes me feel... Uh, like I get to do something I never that like you fantasize about, but that I've never done really. 
I've done like a couple of one night gigs at 54 Below, but I've never had a band. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Right, right. a band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes me feel like that. It makes me feel kind of cool, you know? Yeah. Um, and there, it's a cool New Orleans it's feel, cool too. Oh, so yeah. It's feel. Jazz. And then, All there's of one it. time during this one song at the end of the first act that. Uh, there's just a guitar solo while nothing else is happening. And that's when I feel the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and I love the stuff you post on, like, Inst again, like I stalk you on Instagram. You post the coolest behind-the-scenes stuff. Mm. And it's kind of rare for, yeah. so, you know, they don't, you don't really see that very often. So, and all your throwback stuff from past shows. Thank you. you posted one picture from the balcony. Yeah. And I thought that was the coolest from Thank like see, peeking through and peeking through the screen. Do you guys yeah, do this? Yeah, you never on, see that stuff. Do you do this on Instagram? I you know, I go to the insights on it and mm -hmm. see like which are the ones that people are liking yeah, the most, absolutely. which yeah. are they interacting with the most and then I just try to do more of that. And exactly what you said, people love the backstage stuff. Oh you know? yeah. I can post something, I don't know, something else that I think is really, really cool, and they're like, nah, six likes. I'm like that, but it's usually <laughs> butt photos. I'm like, oh, this is a great show. Oh, okay. <laughs> if I could do that, I would. But yeah, and, and pretty much if I post. I don't think you get that many likes. Yeah. The only time my posts do well is if my wife is in them, so <laughs> as you would understand. So. No, but that's what I want to see, because seeing, like, the behind-the-scenes um, rehearsals, you know, the like I said, like, the photo from the balcony, you don't get to see that. You see the show, and that's it. Well, maybe so. maybe that's the common denominator. That people want either behind the scenes or behinds. <laughs> yeah, it's, everything's about behind. <laughs> Just alternate. <laughs> Fun photo, BTS. <laughs> BTS, there you go. <laughs> but I guess even 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 in the, the, the adult industry, BTS photos always do well. Yeah, so but I think it's they like, want to see how the sausage as, is made. You it's know? not as cute. No. Behind the scenes. <laughs> Behind the scenes. <laughs> no. I try, I, I, believe me, there's a lot of bars that aren't as cute. I, <laughs> I try to put the ones that people will the, like. The good ones. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I, I, mean, I have so much, like, sadness, though, because I, you play so many cool roles mm. that I saw, like, you were the Grinch. Yeah. And I was like, oh, as, as my Christmas God, season I approaches. Missed it. I missed it. I, I loved doing that. I, I grew up uh, just completely obsessed with the Grinch. So I learned the entire book by heart. Oh, wow. And then I would torture everyone at, in December, <laughs> and probably in November too, by reciting it. And I did this in grade school, I did this in junior high, high school, and in college. So there would be a blackout or whatever, and yeah. everybody would be stuck, and I'd be like, okay, I'll do the Grinch. <laughs> and I would just start every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. And I'd go all the way through to the end. It takes about 12, 13 minutes without the songs, you know, and the commercials. And so when I heard it was being done on Broadway, I was like, I got it. I got to get in this. And I fought for an audition. They did not want to see me, I don't think, because they wanted to hire a, 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 name. a name star, you yeah. know, anybody. Um, and... Uh, but I did the audition and um, was it the easiest audition you've ever done? It was because I <laughs> I said to uh, I, I didn't tell my agent what I was going to do, but I got in the room for the audition and they give you you know something to read sides, um, and so there was a scene, and they also gave me I think a song from the show, and I said I really appreciate you giving me the material, but if you don't mind, I would rather just do the book mm. and sing the song from the. The, the cartoon <laughs> and they were like well what <laughs> so but like, they remembered you okay go ahead so that's what I did I did the book yeah and I sang by heart and I sang the song you know you're a mean one Mr. Grinch yeah and they were like okay that was then <laughs> could you imagine like when you leave the room they're like what was that yeah. <laughs> was like... then I had to be approved by the Dr. Seuss estate oh Dr. Seuss had passed away but his widow Audrey Geisel was set to fly across the country and see me in The Lion King. I was playing Scar. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Yeah. yeah, and she was supposed to come and she couldn't. So they sent this man who's like the executor of the Dr. Seuss yeah. estate. He was old. He was he was a <laughs> hundred and something, oh. and he was wearing a tie that had the Grinch on it. And he came to see The Lion King, and I thought, well, this is you know he's gonna love me in this. I, I was just. And <laughs> another he, one I wish I saw. He Just came saying. back and knocked, and I thought he was going to say, throw his arms around me and say, thank God we found our Grinch, and he did not. So <laughs> he just left, and he said, thank you for your performance, and went out into the street. So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, 
I didn't tell him the one thing that was most important, that this show means so much to me. Right. So I get my lawn and makeup off, <laughs> and I run out into the street, and I'm now looking for this little old man oh. in the middle of Times Square. <laughs> Good luck. Right in, in the, the middle, middle of Times Square by the TKTS With booth. the other two million people exactly. there. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. But I found him, and I said to him, look, I understand that you can find someone who will sell more tickets than me. I understand you can find someone who will allow you to attract more investors than me, but I promise if you give me this role, you will not find anyone who will cherish and protect this character in the way that I will. And it turns out it was the perfect thing to have said because apparently Audrey Geisel had been so upset about things that had happened in the Grinch film. Oh, okay, oh. yeah. That she wanted someone who really cared about the book. Mm -hmm. And so then I got a call. I got on the subway and 20 minutes later, I got a call from my, uh, from the director of the show, actually, because the director wanted me to get the part, saying, what did you say to that old guy? <laughs> I said, I'll tell you later. And he said, well, whatever you said, you got the part. So, oh, that's so great. It was, it was a little lesson for me in, you know, speaking what's in your heart. Yeah. yeah and telling people what you want. You you very rarely get things that you don't ask for. Well, Absolutely. Just, just you texting me and saying, hey, you want to be on the podcast? Yeah, right. If we yeah. didn't ask. If you don't ask, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not going yeah. through, like, who has podcasts. You yeah. ask and you find out. That's true. Yeah, and That's it worked true. out. Yeah. <laughs> it works yeah. out, yeah. I remember telling him, like, oh, God, that would be goals. <laughs> like, I would love to have him on. Then a couple, like, a few a little bit later, he's like, so? <laughs> <laughs> so so we had we had a little conspiracy going. Dave Thomas Brown, who has the lead in Book of Mormon, yeah. is a very close friend of ours saw a podcast where we were talking about Broadway, and she said, oh, I want Paige Patrick on the podcast. So he texts me, and he says, Vic, yeah. <laughs> I got a number for you. I'm like, well, make oh, sure it's okay with him first. Good. And then, we, then we reached out and went good. from there. So. Well, I met he and his fiance at uh, 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 um, another charity event. Yeah. I'm going to one tonight. So, um, And I just thought they were so charming. Yeah, they're, they're great. Yeah. They're my Disney couple. I love them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and his fiance has done the makeup for my wife's TV show, Dinner with Danny, and a bunch uh, of yeah. other stuff. So I actually knew his fiance when I did fashion work. So I met her first. And Dave is, and, and actually, Amelia was the one who recommended Hades down to us. Yeah. She saw yeah. it in previews. Yeah. Yeah. And she was like, You have got to see this show. So mm -hmm. we went, Okay. That's great. It's funny how the world works. That's great. Yeah. They're, they're our Broadway friends. And now we've got more Broadway <laughs> yeah. friends. It works out really well. <laughs> yeah. For me, it works out great because, like I said, I've been a Broadway geek since I was like four. So this that's this awesome. is like phenomenal for me. So. Yeah, that's awesome. So you've, you've had a pretty good career on Broadway so pretty far. Pretty good. Pretty solid. You know, you've done really a bunch good. Of great roles. What's your favorite role other than Hades? On Broadway? On Broadway. Oh. On Broadway. I think there have been a lot that I love so much, and whenever you're doing them, you think this is the one. But when I look back, in terms of, for me, how much I learned, I did a, a play called Casa Valentina by Harvey Firestein, mm -hmm. in which I played a, 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 a kind of person that I didn't know existed, which is a heterosexual cross-dressing man. Ooh. And I stupidly, I think, or not not stupidly, naively, mm -hmm. assumed that if a guy liked to put on a dress, it meant he was gay or at least bi. Mm -hmm. And turns out, no, there are a lot of, mm -hmm. there. there's a lot of straight men who really, really need to cross-dress. They don't feel comfortable unless they cross-dress. And so the play was about a place in the Catskills called Casa Susana, which was a real place. In the play, it's called Casa Valentina where they created a kind of a little resort for men from New York City in the early 60s. They'd go up to the Catskills, they could put on a dress, and they could relax. That's so cool. Yeah. It's like a of nudist places, beach yeah. for New Yorkers. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> used to call those the Jewish Alps. Yeah, it was it, like all of the, you know, the Kellermans exactly. and all of that kind oh of stuff gosh. was up there. And so I played this character whose male name was George and whose female name was Valentina. And I just learned so much, and I met... A lot of people in the trans community at that time have stayed friends, uh, and it taught me a whole hell of a lot. And also, it was just a hard role for me. Yeah. Uh, when I first got it, I was just convinced that they'd made a mistake. <laughs> like, why are you doing <laughs> and, this? And so? that, in particular, my voice was unsuited to the part. Um, and so I went through a few weeks of like trying to soften my voice. It was just absurd. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, it was just like, no, this is who it is. If I needed to put on a dress, that yeah. wouldn't alter me physically in any way, except I. So I 
met some more people, understood more what was going on, and um, and we had an extraordinary cast. It was directed by Joe Mantello, who's one of my favorite directors in town director, by yeah. far. Great director. And uh, it was just a great experience. So I'd so say, the first time I'd you put on a dress, were you like, damn, I look good? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It does do something to you. <laughs> I would imagine, right? It's a, it's a complete well, transformation almost. It is. I, I realized a number of things. One, it does feel good. <laughs> I mean, it feels good. To, uh, and uh, you, you feel more available, more open, more free. Uh, at least I did. I don't yeah, know about yeah. you. <laughs> um, and, but also, I realized how much of what I thought was just my own behavior was kind of performed maleness. Okay. The way a man sits, the way mm -hmm. a man gestures, the way a man speaks. Um, that to be, re and I think this is part of why these men find it so comforting to be relieved of that by putting mm -hmm. on a dress. There's not, there's no requirement for me to be manly or butch in any way. I can just relax. It's kind of the opposite for women. Because if I wear a dress, I'm like, okay, cross my legs, right. keep my ankles together. But if I'm in sweatpants, I'm like, spread leg right. on the couch, <laughs> like, don't care. I think that's exactly right. So, um, so I, lo I love that show. Yeah, that's that's a cool. That's awesome. Another one I wish I saw. Yeah. I'm just gonna add it to the list. Just to the list. Well, you did. You did. You were in Dracula, also, right? I was in Dracula years ago. I played Dracula a couple times in two different adaptations of the play. I love that character. But I grew up obsessed with Dracula, and uh, there used to be a program on when I was a kid called Dark Shadows. I remember Dark Shadow. I love Dark and Shadows. Jonathan Frid was the yes. guy on that, and I wanted to be like him. So. Uh, which, if you watch Dark Shadows now, you would understand I was a very twisted child. For wanting to <laughs> it's be okay, like I, love, I love Dark uh, Shadows, too. I think we're close in age, uh, so I think, yeah. It's like, so, um, yeah, meanwhile, I'm like, what's Dark Shadows? Yeah, what's Dark Shadows? <laughs> you would love it, actually. You, you actually would love it. You actually would um, love it, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I played Dracula, and, and I, I love that. And that has some similarity with Hades. For me, a I can bit. See that. Yeah, the play I, is it. Is it the same one that Langella did? Frank Langella did the same version of I've it. I've never done that one. No. Oh, okay, because that's the one I, I saw. The Frank Langella. Right. I actually saw Frank Langella, and it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It was just, and he was great. I that's mean, one of my great. other favorite roles. Is I played Henry VIII opposite his Thomas More. Oh, Ooh. that would I would have loved and to have oh. seen that. So I had like a twenty-five <laughs> minute two-person scene with Frank Langella. Uh, that's, How cool. So that has to be among my favorites. Yeah, that was the, that was the, the he played Dracula and that was his launching point. Oh my goodness. That was they did a they did a cool set when when I saw it they did a cool set. everything was black and white yeah. and there was one oh, thing on the stage yeah, that yeah. was red. Yeah. And you had to kind of find it if it was a rose or a light on a radio yeah. or whatnot, but everything was black and white. It was very well done. Yeah, so. the design was all by Edward Gorey. Is that who, was, who did yeah. Oh wow that was Yeah it was so it told you right away when you came in that there was something camp and fun about it yeah. that you could relax and have fun, mm -hmm. not to take it too seriously. Yeah, that's why I love set design. Don't yeah. get me started on set design obsession. Well, that's, that's, that's <laughs> a, especially on Broadway because you are limited. You know, it's yeah. funny, if you, and, and I know many of the audience hasn't, but if you ever get onto a Broadway stage, like where they do Book of Mormon is a perfect example, it's tiny. tiny. The mm -hmm. backstage is as big as where we're standing, you know, where we're sitting at the moment. And, and what always amazed me, too, is if you stand on the stage and look out, the audience looks a lot closer <laughs> than when you're in the audience looking in. I have funny? It's really weird. Everybody has that same experience. When yeah. they get, and when you come onto the stage at the Walter Kerr, I think you'll experience that even more. Although the Book of Mormon house is also quite small. See, it's, well, most, yeah. most of the houses are small. Yeah. I mean, other than the Winter Garden, a couple, even the Schubert, they're not big houses. I was shocked when I came to New York for that reason because I came from the West Coast yeah. in 1993. For what part? Uh... In, I grew up in Oregon. Okay. And then I had kind of gone all around different places. And and the theaters out there, because everything is new, yeah. are big. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I came here with the play called The Kentucky Cycle after having done it at the Kennedy Center. And it was in the theater. I think it's now, I forget what it's called now, but it was called The Royale. Oh, I, I, okay. I know which theater you're And doing, yeah. I was just like, the audience was there yeah you know it was uh, it's exciting for the actors it's it's great i mean i guess and like i said when you step on stage you look out you realize oh wow they can see a lot yeah <laughs> they can see a lot more than they expect we found that out the hard yeah, way yeah i was gonna tell that story yeah, you should probably okay tell that so I'll, I'll make it quick but uh speaking of dave dave is very prominent in this episode apparently but I did. first time we saw him on book of mormon 
we had kind of a drunken idea, us and a friends of ours. There's four of us in total. Oh, we'll wear really bright shirts that say Dave Thomas Brown Fan Club and just embarrass him. <laughs> So Our, we orange and so pink. we got orange and pink shirts. We're we, we're sitting front row mez, and we're like, oh, he's not really gonna see us, but we'll just be obnoxious, and at the end, we'll cheer and just totally embarrass him. <laughs> Intermission comes, and he texts Vic, "Are you guys wearing orange shirts?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, we can. <laughs> my, my wife, bless her heart, if she is bored, yeah, she has a defense mechanism, which is she'll just fall asleep. <laughs> so if a show is bad, oh. she'll fall asleep. Now, <laughs> this happens, and a lot of people do. Yeah. Not a lot, but, you know, I can see the audience. Yeah. And I sometimes want to say to somebody, you know, pay 200 bucks for a ticket, and Come. they're fast asleep. Yeah, yeah. You can get a decent room for 200 bucks. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> With a bed, you can lay down. <laughs> but anyway, so Paige will sometimes have this response and fall asleep. I've also had that response. <laughs> and But in New York... Oh, <laughs> people know who we are. Yeah, uh, not not all over New York, but in like a little especially ten block the, radius, yeah, especially yeah, yeah. in the Broadway area. Right. Yeah. So that everybody on stage can see, and I'm always like, "Honey, wake up, wake up!" <laughs> she will dispute that. I yeah, I'm love sure it. she will. It's true. We'll have to get her know. on the podcast. I don't know why I'm thinking of Jack Nicholson and Witches of Eastwick when he falls asleep during yeah, the symphony. Yeah, exactly. That's, at least not snoring. Hopefully, that's. I fell asleep at a show in Dublin recently, and I was so. <laughs> embarrassed because um, I saw that you guys you were stalking me on Instagram and I was stalking you guys on Instagram and I saw that you were traveling Scotland yeah. and, and drinking scotch and I thought that sounded like heaven it was one of the reasons I wanted to do the podcast because I was like these guys are like me so, um, yeah, we, we do drink a lot of scotch <laughs> so um, so we were going through uh, we were in Dublin, and, and we we had gone bar hopping before the show. Right. So I was already like, oh, man, you know. <laughs> and we get in there, and I start hating the show. And, oh, no. Uh, and I just fell asleep, which is okay. Yeah. It's Dublin. No one knows me, except apparently there were people who had seen me uh, down there. Oh, my God. And apparently, according to Paige, I snored. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't wake you up? I would have been she like. She tried, but I was. Just... You were gone at yeah. that point. Uh... Could you imagine? You're like, yeah. He's here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my yeah. God, it's so embarrassing. But it happens to the best. I of mean, us. yeah. You know, especially if you've gone pre-gamed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <know? laughs> if you go see, I, 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 unfortunately, or depend, fortunately, how you look at sort of Nicholas Nickleby. Mm. That was a tough play to guess. What's about. that? Here in New York. Yeah, yeah, here in New York. It was. Give me a five-second summary. Well, it was eight uh, hours long. It was eight hours long. There's a five-second summary. It was I mean, eight hours long. But it's one of the great theater pieces ever oh, made. It, it is. Wow. It's phenomenal. Was there were there breaks? There yeah. was one or two. Two. There's an intermission yeah. in each part. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then there's a dinner break of about. Yes. Oh, okay. And that's not so bad. It's it's that's not. A it's, but it's 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 morning tonight. So when you have the dinner break, you have a couple of glasses of wine. Yeah. <laughs> that second half, you're like, oh boy. And it's is and it, it like long or it's long. <laughs> it's long. Oh. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's a, a good it, nap. It's one. one of those where you go to it and you say, thank God I went. I don't know if I'd go a second time, but I'm glad I went the first time. Yeah. <laughs> it Nicholas Nickleby was one. Of, I didn't get to see it live because I was out uh, in Oregon then, but I saw it on television and I just it was one of the things that made me want to be an actor because. It was the Royal Shakespeare Company, and each actor would play multiple roles. Yeah, but oh. very frequently you didn't even know. So you'd be in the you'd be in like the sixth hour of something, and be like, "Oh my god!" Oh, they switched during the sh yeah, the they same the show all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's and you don't so know. And cool. I, I remember there was a character called Mulberry Hawk. Yes, and there was a character called John Browdy, and they couldn't have been more different. The one was this big oafish country boy, and the other was this incredibly slick evil lord. And I realized in about the sixth hour that they were both played by the same, same guy. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I was like, I want to do that. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And, Bro and Broadway's a commitment because there's no cut retake. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's no cut retake. Right. You make a mistake, you make a mistake. Right. What if someone sneezes on stage? It's happened. I've <laughs> always waited for that. It happened to me the other night. Did it really? Yeah. I was uh, in the scene with Persephone, Am the great Amber Gray, who plays... Persephone opposite me and has done for over three years. She's fantastic. She's, she's Thank phenomenal. you. I yeah. think she's phenomenal. And uh, 
we come out and we're super mad at each other and we're sort of like standing across this pit from each other and I just have this thing of like, I have to sneeze. I have to sneeze. <laughs> and it is not... And you can't, you can't like put your finger no. under your nose. And, 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 and like the least badass, I'm supposed to be acting really badass at that moment. Yeah, like sneezes the are least not, yeah. badass thing I can do is sneeze right now. So I turned my back to the audience and then I did one of those. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think it fooled anybody. <laughs> but that's it. If, you, if you go to Broadway enough and you've been to enough plays, mm-hmm. you will see, especially you will see it. Like, we'll go back to Dave again. We've seen Book of Mormon about nine times, but there have been a couple of times where we've seen them had to bring a mic out on stage because yeah. somebody's yeah. mic broke. I, or but you got to have compassion. Yeah. Because... And you do. And, and you know, the, that's the great part is watching how they work through yeah. it seamlessly in some, we, ha- in some way. There's a lot of, in Town. there's a lot of things I couldn't figure out. A yeah. lot of switches and a lot of like just seamless movements that Absolutely. I want to go back and see it multiple times yeah. to kind of. We've had people that come 20, 30, 40 times. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of like, that kind of mishap, we when I was in Lion King, did you ever, have you seen mm-hmm. the Broadway yeah, version? Yeah, we saw yeah. Broadway. So you know that like Pride Rock spirals up out of yeah. the floor. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes it doesn't work. Oh, shit. Oh, Jesus. And <laughs> that's an important, that's an important <laughs> no. piece. Don't forget that this is technology that was installed 25 years ago. That's true. Oh, right. Yeah, I forget yeah. it's, been on, that's, yeah, it's yeah. been on Broadway for a long time. It's like time. seeing, I saw you guys were in Disney World. It's like yeah. seeing, like, the Hall of Presidents. Yeah, right. Like, yes. When you were 12, it was, like, super impressive. But yeah. now it's like, you know, yeah. now it's got a lot of robots yeah. now. Um, so it sometimes doesn't work. And... Uh, which is okay. You can kind of do the show without it. It's not as good. But at the end, um, there's another part where Scar has to fall off this rock. And mm-hmm. The whole thing gets mucked up when Pride Rock doesn't work. And so sometimes we, when that wall didn't work as well, which happened frequently, I would have to run out on the stage. And instead of falling to my death, um, the hyenas would just eat me. <laughs> Which was really, really lame, <laughs> considering that they're puppet oh, hyenas. Yeah. <laughs> oops. <laughs> they just slowly crawl yeah. off. Yeah, yeah that's so... Uh, welcome. Oh, yeah, I mean, you did, and to transition into it, you did Spider-Man. I did. Speaking and of things going wrong. And that had a lot wrong. of things go wrong. I mean, that, was, that just became almost oh, legendary no. on Broadway. From my, I know my daughter had gone to see it, and at one point, Spider-Man just got stuck over her head. Like, literally yeah. over her head. And he was looking down at her, like, you know, shrugging his shoulders, like, oh, okay, I don't yeah. know what to do. And they had to figure out how to... And they do they, like, stop the play and get him Yeah, we had down? to stop very frequently. And the reason for that was there was a lot of press about that at the time that... Um, I guess it is a malfunction in a sense, but there were two kind of stories going. One yeah. was that things were malfunctioning, and the other was that mm. people were getting hurt. Yeah, mm. and in fact, when a Spider-Man stopped like that, that was a, a, what's called an emergency stop because the computer, if the person was even a, an inch off of where they were supposed to be, which right. would be if the dancer maybe just swung a little too much weight one way yeah. or the other, mm-hmm. then everything would stop. Oh. As a safety device. It's mm-hmm. called the e-stop, the emergency stop. So when they got stopped like that, it was it was a safety yeah. issue. Um, That's nice, though. I mean, better safe than sorry. Uh, well, Absolutely. There were people who broke, like, legs. And there yeah, were, like, but all not, kinds of... But not flying. Not that flying, was, really? Not flying, no. My friend Chris Tierney fell from a ramp above the stage Oof. down into the orchestra pit about <gasps> 30 feet. Yeah, it broke both his legs, oh right? Oh, my yeah. God. But... I think the easy thing to forget is that that's an accident that can happen yeah. on, any, on any show. Yeah. Yeah. People fall into pits on almost every show. They fall into pits at Wicked, Little Mermaid, yeah. Pits are... Is there like a pit. mattress down there or yeah. any kind of... No, no there's, they a, should there's, put a little... there's a tuba. They should put... <laughs> you're falling into, you're well, falling into in, the brass in section. In this case, there was just a hard floor. Oh, and God, and he broke everything. Yeah, oh, he, but he, he was a guy. Superman. He's he's well now. Is he performing still or is he back to? He is performing and he's since played leading parts. Oh, and, that's great. That's good to um, hear. But uh yeah, we had on the the previews for that show went on for so long. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, they were there was <laughs> six, <laughs> six months. I was like it seemed like it went on for a oh year. Six months of previews. Yeah. So <laughs> trying to get things right. <laughs> oh, Could you imagine what the tech was like on that? I mean, were you there I was for there. the tech? I don't have to oh, at some point were you like, well, you were there from it. day one. Oh, oh absolutely. god. So the tech so, on that must have been brutal. <laughs> it was brutal. So and we kept putting off the opening. Mm-hmm. So we had put it off now about three or four times. 
And the critics finally got a little fed up with this. Yeah. And they said, well, we're going to come to this one you announced. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> now, you're, now you're screwed. Ready or not. Yeah, here we come. And nobody in our building seemed to accept that reality that they would be out there that night. I, I was confident they would be. But many people said, this is just another show. Just go do your show. Well, guess what? We get to the part where there, there's the big climactic fight between Peter Parker, played by Reeve Carney, who mm. plays Orpheus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And me. Yeah. And all of a sudden we hear over the loudspeaker, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to hold, hold the show for a minute. We have a, a technical problem. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> worst time, right when you're building up to an and, emotional crescendo. Hold on, hold on, wait a second. And the critics were in the house. Uh, so I did some ad-libbing. And Reeve was, at that time, not as comfortable with ad-libbing as he is now. <laughs> so he went over to the piano. We had a piano on stage where I had been playing and drinking champagne. So he goes over, and in order not to have to talk, he starts drinking the champagne. <laughs> so I said to him in my Green Goblin voice, I said, you better be careful, boy, because about how much champagne you drink, because you're going to be flying in a couple of minutes, and I hear they dropped a few. <laughs> 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 Oh, oh perfect. My God. Well, the next day, Ben Brantley's review was all about that moment. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> what a love, save. I love Brent. <laughs> ben can be a little brutal. Well, <laughs> it was a good review for me, but unfortunately, yeah. not good for yeah. the show. Yeah. What is it like working? Like, you had worked with Peter before and now worked with him on a different show. Is I it, love him so much. <laughs> is, it, is it weird, like, working with someone again in a different character? It's not. No. I used to, my. My training, such as it is, I never went to a, a drama school or something like that, but I did a lot of repertory theater when I was young. Okay. Meaning um, a, a theater where you change uh, shows from night to night to night. Mm -hmm. So I would play Cyrano de Bergerac on one night, and then I'd play Malvolio on Twelfth Night the next night. Oh, wow. Or I would play... That's a lot of lines to uh, yeah. Yeah. at the same time. And, and so you were constant, And then the rest of the cast would change. So the actor who was playing... You know, opposite you, uh, the, the, in that particular case, off the top of my head, the actress who was playing uh, Roxanne opposite me in uh, Cyrano was playing uh, Viola in Twelfth Night, with oh, whom I had so a kind of an adversarial relationship. So it's, it's kind of like musical chairs yeah, for theater. Yeah, you, you just make the change in your mind. You know, I was thinking uh, it's the same in any. We do that in life. We just we know what role we're supposed to be at, and we and we slip right into it. And it's it's not terribly difficult. Although my father was an actor. Really? Oh, was he really? Yes, and he had the first two lines in two shows at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in Ashland, Oregon. He had the first line in Twelfth Night, mm. which is "If music be the food of love, play on," mm -hmm. and he had the first line in. The Merchant of Venice, uh. which is, in sooth, I know not why I am so sad. In those days, you dressed in Elizabethan garb for Shakespeare, so it all looked alike. And he was in the same place, which was on the balcony there, coming out. So apparently he came out, looked at the audience, and mm -hmm. had no idea which play he was oh, in. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did he start? <laughs> so he started, in sooth, I know not why, and then he felt the guy next to him go, <laughs> <laughs> a little grab and he said I in sooth I know not why music be the food of love but if it be play on <laughs> so I guess it does adaptation happen of Shakespeare. Yeah, I choose okay. to believe that oh, story so although good. it sounds a little too good to a little be apocryphal yeah. yeah but that's great I love it <laughs> that's awesome so I've got to ask and, and it because it's it's literally my favorite play. Have you ever done the role of Caiaphas in Jesus Christ Superstar? Oh, because God. your voice, I I've wanted to. That, you it, have the perfect voice for that role. You. <laughs> you really do. Thank you. There was a point where it looked like I might play it uh, recently, and uh, something else came up, and I withdrew. Uh, from is it still? Is it? It comes on? back and forth. Okay. It comes back. It was supposed to have been redone recently, but that kind of fell through. Yeah. They, they were going to do it at Madison Square Garden, which yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah. I'd still go. But, um, I want to see I know it. that they, they, they had done it in London uh, for right. about two or three. I don't know if it's still going on there, but it was, it was going on. They brought on that, before. I think, over here and are touring it a little They're bit. They're touring I it think. a little bit, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that piece. It's, it's kind of a, it's a small role for someone of your stature, but that's... I just mean, a, it's, great it's a great part. It's a great yeah. part. It's, Who it's, cares what size I mean, it is? Yeah. <laughs> that's Any time I've ever seen, I've seen that play probably more than any other, when the person... Yeah, I always wait for that role to see how 
bass the bass is going to well, be he, because, because, because just... he, he starts on one of his lines. <laughs> oh, oh, gentlemen. Yeah, and you're you like, you know why we are here. And you can actually hear the audience go, <laughs> and like they gasp, like, wow, it's, you know, it's pretty a, much it's... what I did when I saw yeah, you when, the first when, time. <laughs> when you said, it was so funny, when you said that line, I went, oh, God, I wish you would do kind of. That was like the first thing that went through my head. So. I, I want to, so hopefully I will. Yeah, it's a, and that's, a, like I said, that that's, I, there are two plays I've seen a billion times Jesus Christ Superstar is one, and Rent is the other. Yeah. I was a rent head back in the day, so. Yeah. And Cats. I saw Cats a few times. Book of Mormon's crawling yeah, off the list now. <laughs> so. No one told me Cats was literal. Oh, God. Like that cats. was the, Yeah, I thought it was about best. cats, not people dressed as cats. So, so as, as my wife had said, she was a big opera ballet <laughs> fan. So basically, she's used to a woman being murdered horribly and right. people singing about it. And that was the end of it. Beautiful you know? and music. Beautiful music and reasonably literal. Reasonably literal. Yeah. Right? Reasonably literal. <laughs> We go to Cats, and we took my daughter. It was literally on her birthday, and I... We're second row. Yeah, we're... I for, Speaking I, of small theaters. I forgot to... Yeah, and it's not at the Winter Garden anymore. Oh, yeah. It wasn't at the Winter Garden. Um, I forgot to tell her it was about actual cats. <laughs> I mean, it's it's based on, you know, T.S. Eliot, but I forgot to say the, it was about actual cats. It was actual the second cats. Broadway show I had ever seen. The first was... Um, Something's, Something's Rotten. Something's Rotten which was fantastic. And so I was like, okay, cool. Like, I got a vibe going. And then I saw Cats, and it started, and this guy comes out as in full cat outfit with his leg up to here, and I just lost it. She starts cracking well, up. it is pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I was I not ready. Not stop and he was from here to the wall, and I just could not, and I was trying to hide it, so then I started snorting, and then the people around me started laughing, and I was like, I feel like such a jackass, <laughs> but I can't stop. I'm a little scared about the movie, because they've done yeah. it all with like digital yeah. effects yeah. instead of, I'm a little scared. It, it is very rare when a movie can capture what you get on Broadway. Very rare. Right. Jesus Christ Superstar stunk. I was not right. a big fan of Chicago. I like Chicago on Broadway Trying better. I liked the one. Chicago movie. Oh yeah, Chicago. because you yeah. hadn't seen the original. I Chicago. actually like the movie a little bit better. Don't yeah. hate me, but I love. I, I get it, but yeah, Paige actually, and I Paige thought we was, were gonna. Well, Paige played was Roxy. in Chicago. Yeah. yeah, she played Roxy a lot for many years. And uh, we thought we were going to hate the Chicago movie, even though, like, we love Rob Marshall, we love the people yeah. in it, but we thought, you know, we're just too close to it. And I was surprised. I really liked it. It's very different. It's very I, different. So I think it was I think different why, enough. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. my problem was is I wasn't a big fan of him as the lawyer. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I think Tyson Beckford was in it with, and he played the lawyer role when I saw it oh. on Broadway. One of the times I saw it on Broadway, so kind of. But of them all, that's, that's done well. I mean, the rest of them... It's, it's hard. very, it's very, Rent did actually a decent job of capturing yeah, some of it. I don't remember the Rent. But that was, um, uh, De Niro was the producer on that. Oh, yeah. And uh, I can't remember. They brought in, I can't, the director is Chris, uh, I can't think, I can't remember who it was, but he did a great job. And they did a decent job of, of capturing, having grown up in New York, what these village look like back right, in those days. Right. But um, yeah, that's, that's just, about it. What is that, what is that like? Because you do both. So you yeah. you act and yeah. you do live stage. Is that the right term? Yeah. Live stage. Yeah. Did I screw that up? But yeah. when you go, because you just did the season finale of yeah. Evil, of right? Of Evil. Yeah. Well, I'm still it... shooting it tomorrow and the next day. I thought I was so scared. I thought I might have to shoot today, and then I'd have to call you. And I hate canceling on people yeah. at the last minute, but I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> uh, Is it? Do you have a preference? Do you have a favorite? Is it? Well, I, I, my favorite is stage, but I think that's because I played great, great roles on stage. I've never played a great role on television or mm -hmm. film. I think if I played a great role, I might find that I really loved it. So I'm looking forward to perhaps doing that one day. Doing it like multiple times and doing multiple takes, do you like that? Or do you like just having a one, t you know, when you're on stage, you can't have another take? I like the continuity of playing something from the beginning to the end. Because mm -hmm. I, as an actor, I really try to think of the character's arc where he starts and where he ends up and because I think what an audience appreciates more than anything is watching the change in a character mm -hmm. so tracing that and trying to pull those two poles as far apart as I can so if I can put Hades here in terms of his um, uh, toxicity maybe and then get him to over here to his love for Persephone I mm -hmm. think that's what's interesting so that's much harder to do on film. Yeah, because they shoot out of order. Yeah. Shoot out of order and shooting a number of takes where if I'm really responding in the moment to my fellow actors, um, I'm giving multiple versions of the scene. Mm -hmm. 
And then the director's going to choose the interpretation. Yeah. Right. He's going to choose, he or she is going to choose, or they are going to choose, <laughs> uh, which of those takes tells the story they want to tell about mm-hmm. the story. I and it might tell. not be your personal right. favorite. So, yeah. Yeah. so, but I watch a performance like, let's say, Brian Cranston in Breaking Bad, mm-hmm. right. which is just clearly one of the great performances of all time. And I can see how rewarding it must have been to play that role over a period of years mm-hmm. and to follow a man. I've only done one long form uh, role and it was in a series on stars called Flesh and Bone. And I just started to get interested in the character and then we got canceled. But I was I like, I really, you off. Yeah, well, I really want to see where too. this goes, you know. Do you ever notice characters kind of go with you after you finish playing them? Yes. Or say, or sh- stay with you is probably a better term, but. Well, the characters can be very persuasive in, in their ideology. So, uh, for example, I played Iago in Othello. Yeah. And Iago in Othello is just almost evil incarnate, but yeah. a hu- full human being, because Shakespeare would never write a, a, a non-true character. So he's psychopath, uh, com- with a complete predator, uses other people, and really believes that anybody who has a different belief system than that yeah. is just a fool. Mm-hmm. Um, anybody who believes in kindness or love or God compassion or, or yeah. compassion or religion is just an idiot, because you're just gonna get stepped on. And I lived in, I, I, I studied the role over a course of about a year and then played it for several months. And I found that during that period of time that that ideology, that philosophy became really compelling to me. I, I believed it. Yeah. And it, it's ca- kind of hard not to believe sometimes when you uh, see Donald Trump as president, see this completely toxic individual who nevertheless has gotten everything he wanted in life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and think so, oh, that, that works for some people. And um, so, uh, I'm sorry to offend anybody who's a <laughs> fan of Donald Trump. I am not a fan of Donald Trump. Don't write them letters. Um, <laughs> we're, uh, we're in New York City, folks. <laughs> yeah. um, Most people here haven't been fans of Donald Trump since the 80s. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Uh, everybody's w- welcome to their own opinion. Yeah. Um, but that's mine. And so I, 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 that was hard, and I kind of went into a depression after that um, show because I, I really couldn't shake the notion that yeah. um, it, evil existed and, 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 and ultimately prevailed, mm-hmm. and that was hard. Biz- bizarrely, yeah. and it's funny because I've, I've used this a few times before, but there's actually, uh, strangely, a Star Trek episode from the original series. We're going to get nerdy on you right now. We're going to get a little nerdy on you where <laughs> good has to battle evil. Captain Kirk has to battle somebody evil, and oh, yeah. I, I'll never forget... McCoy's line to, to, to Spock at the time, he's literally he's like, I found that evil usually succeeds unless good is very, very careful. Yeah. You know, and it's and it's and it was especially for the sixties, kind of like bizarre take on oh, good always won. You know, guy in the white hat always well, that's, won. That's, you know, and that was his way of saying, mm-hmm. you know what? It doesn't that's always work out there. Like, that's the narrative himself, we grew up right? with, right? No, that was the uh Sorry, I, No, you're fine, you're the fine. Com, the comms and the yangs. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're I'm catching up on my nerd. <laughs> well, I watched them all uh, when I was younger, but i I think I've forgotten a lot of them. But I I, I remember a lot of them too. They were basically morality plays. They were morality plays, yeah. yeah. basically morality um, plays. Yeah, so I, I, I think, and then other characters, maybe you aspire to their level of courage, like Cyrano de Bergerac. Right. But this guy who has the courage to just step outside and be who he is. Physical, you know? yeah, physical yeah. problems, but yeah. yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, it's interesting we, uh, to me. We have to get to my questions. No, but I, I have fan questions. Sorry. Let me just do a couple. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Which ones haven't we done? I don't. How do you deal with stage fright? I know that's an easy question, but it's a lot not, of people it's ask. It's not an easy question. It's a very hard question. I personally, I whenever I do something like this, I like to talk about the fact that I have depression and I have anxiety because a lot of um, people have depression and anxiety, and they think it's shameful and they can't talk about it. And because they can't talk about it, they don't get treatment. Mm. Yeah. And um, stage fright is kind of an acute version of anxiety that happens under a particular situation. Um, I never thought of it like that, but that totally makes sense, yeah. Yeah. I don't suffer from that, strangely enough. I will have more anxiety 
I ha I'll have to take a beta blocker to go to this gala I'm going to tonight to kind of socialize with people. Oh, we are so similar. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, that's that's there's a difference between social anxiety and yeah, performance anxiety. I have anxiety. massive Huge social difference. anxiety. Right. If you put me in a crowd, I will just go hide right. in the corner. Yeah. And my like, guess is you don't have performance anxiety. No, not right. at all. Um, but, <laughs> and, and, yeah, exactly. But and, and there is also like she has always said, if she is her character, if she is Danny Daniels, that's right. Mm -hmm. She becomes Danny Daniels. It's easier for to deal with it. But I, if she has to go as her. That's it's exactly not it. Simple. It's the mask that you get to wear. It's just, it, mm -hmm. She's playing a character on film called Danny Daniels. I'm playing a character on stage called Hades. Mm -hmm. That's the mask that protects you. Right. Uh, that allows you to be free. Yeah. Um, like, I'm sure if you could go to this event tonight as Hades, you'd be fine. Oh, I'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely great. Yeah. When I was playing the Grinch, we did a lot of, perform a lot of uh, appearances where I appeared as the Grinch. And I was amazed at how sharp and funny I could be when I had that whole green outfit on. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was literally your mask. Yeah. I was, yeah. I was yeah. completely yeah. masked. And I would come up with stuff that I would never come up with <laughs> in my life. I, uh, I was doing The View one day, and Hillary Clinton was doing it the same day. And I kept waiting to meet her, and I never, and I tried not to get into the Grinch outfit because I'd like, I don't want to meet her as the Grinch. I want to meet her as Patrick. <laughs> so this is when she was running for president the first time she was a senator. And I kept not meeting her, not meeting her. And finally, I had to go down and shoot my segment. segment. The dress rooms were on an upper level, and the studio was further down. And so I went down to shoot my segment I'm in full Grinch garb. And I come out of the segment, and in the airlock, that's between the um, studio and the hallway. You know, there's that place yeah, yeah, where yeah. there's the red light that yeah. shows you whether it's yeah. on. Right, the red light's going because it's live. Right, right. And into the airlock with me is my dresser and me and Hillary Clinton and her body person. Oh, that's shit. all. And we're <laughs> in a space this size. And you're like, oh, boy. <laughs> so now I'm meeting you. <laughs> she has to go on live right now. And as the Grinch, and Patrick would never have thought of this, yeah. but as the Grinch, I said... Um, oh, Senator Clinton, it's wonderful to meet you. I'm sorry about all the added security today, but with a star of my magnitude, it's just unavoidable. <laughs> <laughs> now, she laughed. She laughed. That's she laughed. Amazing. It's a distinctive laugh. And um, yeah, she does have a very. Distinctive and then we and then we got a picture. Thank God, my dresser had presence of mind to grab a picture. And then she went on and did her piece. And afterwards, I thought, wow, that is one cool cucumber because yeah. she was going on live and took the time to do that in that yeah. little airlock. That's, yeah, that's really smart. cool. That's smart though. That's... Okay, I have two more. They'll be really fast. One is favorite actor to work with or actress. Hmm. Well, I have to say my wife first because we did a production of I Do, I Do at the Old Globe. I feel like if you don't Sydney. say your wife, you'd be in trouble. Yeah. I would no doubt be in trouble. But now let me think. I will say that for me, because I, like you, I grew up with um, Frank Langella's performance of Dracula as being really iconic for me in the film. I didn't get to see it on stage. And then Frank has had the kind of career that I aspire to, from doing the classics to doing films to playing historical characters like Richard Nixon. It just... He just seems to me to embody what an actor ought to be. So when I got to play with him, that was, uh, I guess I'd say Frank is the favorite person I've played opposite. Yeah, That's really cool. He did, he did such a good job as Nixon. I oh. forgot it was Frank. Oh, that's yeah. what I remember you were telling me about that. I forgot okay. it was Frank. And it was so unbelievable. They did a great job with Frost Nixon. That was an amazing the, um, movie. The but, film yeah. came out when I was in the show with Frank. So he had a private screening and a bunch of us came to this private screening and he got up, made a little introduction, and then we watched the film. And for the first 10 minutes, I was like, because he's sitting there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I was like, that's not Nixon, that's Frank. And then by the end of the film, all I could see was Nixon. Yeah. And I couldn't remember what the real Nixon looked or sounded like. Anymore. No, he did. He, yeah. he embodied it. He yeah. truly embodied it. Yes. Wow. And your last one? Okay, my last one is The Secrets of Such a Long Marriage. Oh, thank you. These, um, I can't take credit. These are actually fan questions that were Oh, that's in, wonderful. Um... Well, first of all, knowing that it's work and accepting that it's work and accepting that part of the fun of it is that, that it's work. Um, I love my work. I love the fact that I'm an actor, but that doesn't change the fact that it is work. It's a job. Yeah, yeah it's a job. Yeah. Um, and people think if you use the word work about marriage, you're saying something pejorative, and you're not. You're saying that there's no exit ramp. Um, 
Because if you go in thinking there's an exit ramp, believe me, there will come a time that you will take it. Yeah, the the exit ramp will will appear. You will take it because there's no way you're going to live with another human being for 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 years without at one point wanting to either kill them or run the other way. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So you just, and knowing that in advance, you can go, okay, I know that's going to come. And when that comes, I'm going to somehow muscle through it. Yeah, you're going to work through it. Work through it. Have you guys been married 20 years? Uh, we've been together 24 years. Okay. We've been married 18 years. That's impressive. That's, that's, that's very, very impressive. In this day and age, especially in theater. In the and, theater. And yeah. I love her 20, and I love you. So, it's so yeah. I always see your cute posts and I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. 20, <laughs> yeah, last night she was posting stuff of us in bed. I was like, honey, stop it. <laughs> yeah, that, sounds, that sounds really familiar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 20, 24 years in entertainment is like 142 yeah. in yeah. real life. And I have so. a bunch of other ones, but I know, I know yeah. you got to do yours. I gotta, but. So I do a, a, a little segment called VIX10. Um, and it's just the same questions that we ask every guest. Oh, so, cool. um, first one is, what's the most annoying question people ask you? Uh, was your voice always like that, or is that your real voice? <laughs> it was like the James Earl Jones question, right? So, was your voice always like that? I usually say, yeah, I terrified the doctors when I popped out. <laughs> I cried uh, the, when the, I really... the, 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 the cry was just, it was horrifying, but... Um, <laughs> Imagining you as like a tiny baby. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and then and then you know, Juba like, is it is it your real voice? I'm like, well, what else is it? I mean, I'm sitting here talking. What do you think it is? I think I have a device here that I like. Twi- yeah, that's that's got to be. Was it James Earl Jones didn't speak for like four years? That's three right. or four years. That's and, right. And, and, yeah, he's got and the, stuttered. Yeah, and stuttered. And he's got one of the most iconic voices of yeah. all time at this point. Uh, what is your favorite way to eat a potato? Baked. <laughs> that's like the, the that's probably the favorite answer. These I always thought it would have been French fries, but baked seems to be the prominent answer. Well, I think we get French fries so often it's not as special. You get a baked potato less frequently. Yeah, true. What would the title of your autobiography be? Oh, I used to know what this was. I think I call it a new low. Ooh, <laughs> I great. like that. That's a great title. Uh, what's the biggest turning point in your life so far? I would say two things. One was moving to New York. Because I was so terrified to move to New York. Okay. How old were you when you moved? Uh, I was 30, 31. Okay. And, but I was, you know, from a tiny town. Yeah, yeah. I believed every stereotype about people being mugged. And back in the day, it was more true. It was the way more true, yeah. And um, uh, every uh, stereotype about people being mugged, about actors not working, about... And I had a fairly decent regional theater career. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just terrified. And, it, of course working through that fear and sticking with it, just like the marriage thing when it got mm-hmm. hard, uh, has paid off. And the other one would be marrying Paige. Yeah. And once again, I was terrified. I waited six years. We, we lived together for six years <laughs> before I got married. So I you guess wanted that, to be sure. She I mean, was like, hello, like, we're pretty much <laughs> married already. I, it wasn't even that I wanted to be sure about her. I wanted to be sure I believe that the idea of saying you'll be you'll live the rest of your life with one person was itself a good idea. And I thought, I'm not going to get married until I think that if marriage didn't exist, I would have invented it for this purpose. Oh, that's, that's a great way to look um, at it. And I finally got there. <laughs> Obviously. <Yeah. laughs> and it's lasted. <laughs> but I always try to look at anything that everybody does and say, um, is this just because everybody does it? Or it, do I believe in it? It's a big thing I feel about uh, the work you do in the mm-hmm. adult industry. It's like... The, the kind of uh, public perception doesn't match what people really Mm-mm. feel in their hearts. Yeah, yeah. Or the industry wouldn't be as huge as it is. <laughs> yeah. So there's this massive hypocrisy, and you have to really look at your own actions and say, well, what do I believe in? But then it's scary to step out and do yeah. that. And, and, yeah. to, and to state it. Yeah. And to actually you know, state that you believe in it. Yeah, yeah, you really have to get to a point where it's you live for you. you live You're not for living for anyone else. Right. So right. I love it. Yes. You know, I know it's not a job for everyone, but I personally, it's a job for me, and I love it. So, well, I imagine it's very, <laughs> very freeing. I'm, I would imagine it is. you're it very. Is. I would ma- imagine you, you would be very hard to cancel mm-hmm. in the cancel culture. How do you, how do you cancel Danny Daniels? What are you gonna say? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> That's it's like you can't threaten me with Whereas anything. <laughs> I can get canceled real easy. Yeah, yeah. tomorrow I can lose thirty thousand yeah. Instagram followers. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Me too. Yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Right. What are you most proud of? Hmm. I guess sticking with doing what I loved and making it work no matter what. And I guess that applies. I was thinking about my career Mm -hmm. and and my work as an actor, but I guess that applies in all these other areas that we've talked about Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
What's your favorite smell? Well, right now, <laughs> I'm really digging the Christmas trees. In, <laughs> in the apartment. Christmas smells? Or even just walking down the street in New York, because yeah. it usually smells like pee. And you're like, oh, it actually smells like pine trees yeah. right now. Yeah, it's got a nice, it's so nice. It's a nice change up. What takes up too much of your time? <laughs> well, I don't know that I can answer that. Um, uh, I don't know. Is that takes up too much of your time or enjoyable? I don't, I'm not sure. Um, uh, well, I'm, Without question, the internet yeah. in, in all of its uh, glories and vices. <laughs> um, I, I'll get into some, if I've had, you know, a couple of drinks, I can get into the most inane conversation with someone who I wouldn't even speak to if they were sitting on the bar stool next to me. Because <laughs> they so clearly haven't read anything to be in the conversation, you know. And, but you'll, yeah. But I keep, oh, just, You'd love uh, Scotland. <laughs> really? Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what gets you fired up? Hypocrisy. Uh and self-righteousness and, and um, uh, what I perceive to be virtue signaling. Okay. I have no trouble with real virtue, but if I sense that they're doing it more to make themselves feel good, that, that really rubs me the wrong way. I can't, I can't blame you on that one. What do you wish you knew more about? Well, I'm a complete moron when it comes to do with anything mathematical. And I bet that's a really, really rewarding and fascinating study because it's it's like the magic of the universe. Yeah, it really is. Right? Um, but I'm terrified of it. I've always been terrible at it. Really? So, yeah, oh, terrible. I'm surprised because you have such a great memory. I mean, you have to. Not, not for that. Not for that. Hmm. Not, not for that. I guess that. Um, I wish I knew more about everything, frankly. I don't feel like, I feel like I know this much about a lot of things. Right. Yeah. And not enough about anything. Except acting. Except acting, but acting because, because of the nature of it, you can study and study and study and teach and teach. I also teach. Um, you can read and read everything that was ever written and it will still be a mystery. You still won't know why on the one night you went out there and it just flew. And you, or even if you know, or think you know, you won't be able to repeat it. You won't be able to do it again. Yeah, and that's the joy of life. That's the joy of life. Last question. What's the one question you would want everyone you meet to answer? What's the one question I want everyone I meet to answer? If you are on an escalator, do you stand in one place or do you keep walking? <laughs> I'm a walker. I'm a walker. Yeah. <laughs> and I only hang out with walkers. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're both, especially down. I'm definitely yeah, yeah. walking down. Yeah. Yeah. Up, it one. depends upon if it's like the six train and it looks like you go into the top of the world. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I still think, to me, it's like, oh, didn't work out today. Here's a nice little, little opportunity. Yeah, that's what I do. It's a little, bit leg, stairs, little leg workout. Keep, uh, and the people who are just standing there, and that's okay. Stand to the right. But if you yeah. stand to the left, you're going to hear yeah, from me. Yeah, yeah. Get, get out of my way. Yeah, yeah, every time we go to London, if someone's standing on both ways, you'll see people, like, push them yeah. out well, of the way. And, and the problem being a New better. Yorker in London is they stand on the wrong side. That's right. That's right. I just they spent five months in London last year, so yeah. well acquainted with it. So that's, yeah. So now we're up to shameless plugging. All right. Um, go check out my calendar that's out, shopddbox.com. You can follow me on Instagram, aka Danny Daniels, and um, keep listening to the podcast because it's super fun to do. Uh, <laughs> I will plug uh, Hades Town on Broadway, obviously. obviously. My you, you'll probably see us there. Yeah, <laughs> probably. My, my Instagram and my Twitter is Paige Patrick, and I've got this episode of Evil coming out on CBS. And if you do have depression or anxiety, um, don't think that uh, medication is uh, such a terrible thing. At least look into it. I take some medication for depression, and way, way more people die of depression than need to because they refuse to even explore the idea of, uh, of medication or treatment. 
a oh. really good voice. And now I have to tell people to buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> On the note of that. Yeah, good luck <laughs> Wait for the coin. That. Yeah, I got to follow it. <laughs> Listen, if you're, if you're just mildly depressed, you might laugh. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> you can find it on Amazon and mm-hmm. also go to dannysthings.com and that's pretty much oh, everything yeah. Danny Daniels. That's so true. You you're better. You should there. just plug my stuff for me because I'm horrible at it. <laughs> that's why I do PR and you do what you do. <laughs> and they say don't meet your heroes and thank you for not sucking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And living up to expectations. Such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much. And um, yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye.